Hi there, I'm the underscore twig, and I like analysing game rules. So, Player's Handbook Playtest 5 is out now. This is obviously what used to be called 1D&D, &D, however they've decided to give it a worse name now. This Unearthed Arcana is gigantic, so I'll be splitting it up into multiple videos. This one will be on the rules glossary, feats and weapons, and then I'll do separate videos on the classes. So if you want to see those, subscribe! I also have a Patreon now if you want to see them earlier than everyone else. So then, this here is the rules glossary. Personally, this is the first bit I read whenever one of these comes out, so it's where I'm going to start. There's not much that changed this time, so it should be fairly quick to go through. The removal of artisans, tools, gaming sets and musical instruments are all kind of odd. All these entries did was just change the cost of all items of that type to be the same. For example, all artisans tools were 15 GP. Not sure why they're removing this, but my best guess is that they'll be replacing all of them with a single generic item. Rather than buying a lute or a drum, you'll just buy a musical instrument. Whilst I think this is fine specifically for musical instruments, I don't like it for artisans tools or gaming sets, simply because they're less culturally common. For example, I bet a bunch of you had never even heard of a cobbler until you read the PHB. This is all speculation though, what's he maybe doing something completely different? They've wrapped up the updated dying condition from Druid and Paladin and just put it in the death saving throws. Fine, nothing particularly interesting. The only point that I actually have is that it seems to just stop Spare the Dying from working now. Druid and Paladin Spare the Dying was an interesting update, although it was blatantly OP. I've got absolutely no idea how to rule it now though. The thing I find most disappointing about this rules glossary though is the removal of the updated exhausted condition. We're going back to that awkward six stage thing now. If the updated exhausted condition got bad responses in the survey, this is the first I've heard about it. I don't think I've actually spoken to anyone who thought that the six stages was better. The rest of this is just clarifications. I like the updated setting the DC in influence. It now says that it's a rule of thumb rather than a minimum which gives us DMs more leeway to make NPCs who we want to be very easily intimidated, or whatever. There are a few things that I spotted which weren't in the changelog, like equipping and unequipping weapons got a slight clarification, but no mechanical changes. And the light weapon property and the short sword are no longer in the rules glossary. However, there's a sidebar explaining that near the beginning of the dock, so I'll forgive them for that one. Next up is feats, which I believe are on page 13. Yes, okay. So most of these are epic boons, but there's one fourth level feat in the updated Weapon Master. This now gives a single Weapon Mastery, which is a new thing in this UA. I'll be talking about them a lot more in just a minute. This is certainly better than the old Weapon Master feat, which was almost worthless. Although I actually think I have seen it on one build where the player had a bard who used a whip. Unfortunately, I still don't think this is that great. Fighters and Barbarians already get at least three of these Weapon Masteries by level four, and I assume that future updates to the Paladin and Ranger will give them some Weapon Masteries too. This means that you're basically already covered. I guess you could take this if you're playing something like a Blade Packed Warlock or whatever the new Valor Bard will look like, but you could also just dip Fighter 1, which is now extremely good. Right, Epic Boons. There are two here that I think finally live up to the name Epic. Dimensional Travel is a free 30-foot teleport every time you use the attack or magic action. The magic action includes activating a magic item. There's no limit to this, it's just free. Fantastic. Epic Boon of the Night Spirit is also amazing. Be invisible whenever, and you also get a huge number of resistances under some fairly common circumstances. I've seen a lot of comparisons to the Gloomstalker. One thing that I did notice though is that the invisibility doesn't end when you step out of darkness. You can just jump into a shadow, go invisible, and then jump back out and walk around invisible. Energy resistance is pretty good. Two floating resistances is nice to have. The energy redirection feature is kind of meh though. A reaction to do 2d12 plus con isn't really worth it at 20th level. Irresistible offense initially sounds amazing. It adds your ability score to damage when you roll a 20. That's your score, not just your modifier. If you have 23 strength, you add 23 damage. Unfortunately, this is when you roll a 20, not when you crit. If you're a champion with crits on 18, you don't get this as well. 
Also, if you actually do the math, this is approximately plus one damage per attack. It kind of sucks. Very fun and high rolly though. Speed is pretty much completely eclipsed by dimensional travel. There's no reason to take this if you're an expert class. On a warrior class, it could be okay. The free escape from a grapple when you disengage is... it's alright. I probably wouldn't jump for something like this, though. As for the last one, Epic Boon of Recovery, that's an awful descriptor. This doesn't help you recover. It basically just gives you a slightly better Relentless Endurance, which is a feature all characters have had since first level. The thing about getting a death save roll instead of taking a fail when you're hit while down is also incredibly weak. I feel like most DMs don't hit the party while they're down. This feat only really comes into play when you're already losing, and I don't think it's even remotely strong enough to create a sort of a comeback effect. Now then, weapons. This is the bit you've all been waiting for, although I like making you wait, so I'm going to cover the dull bits first. Short Sword got moved to martial weapons. Fine, don't really care. The only thing that I can think of that this changes is that bards and warlocks no longer have proficiency. Next up, the lance is now a 1d10 heavy reach two-handed, except when mounted, weapon. That's actually pretty major. Sadly, you can no longer have lance halflings or whatever, but it now works with polearm master from expert classes. That's pretty big. Trident became a d8 weapon, and Warpick got a versatile. Oh, also, the musket and pistol got added. That's pretty cool. There's currently no way to bypass the loading property on these, because Crossbow Expert says that it only works on crossbows. So I actually don't think they're that good, but they are nice to have. Last thing here is the net. I think there are probably three things to talk about here. First, and most obviously, it's a saving throw, not an attack roll. We no longer have that weird thing where you always have disadvantage on net attacks. Second is that the 2014 net said that you can only make one attack with the action you use to throw your net. This no longer says that. Also a very good change. The final thing though is a bad thing, and I think that many people will have missed this. Because the net is no longer a weapon, it can no longer be equipped using the equipping and unequipping weapon section of the attack action. It's unclear how the updated rules will deal with equipping non-weapon items in combat, because we don't know how interact rules will work yet, and the net may suffer because of it. Right, that's the boring stuff, so now on to probably the most interesting thing in this entire document, right after I talk about the Light and Throne properties. S still a little bit more to go. Light requires a bonus action to two-weapon fight again, however there is still a way around this with the Nick weapon mastery. I'll cover that in a minute. That's the only change to light, though. Back in Druid and Paladin, the light property changed, so it no longer requires you to hold the two weapons at the same time, or even hold them in different hands, and that change still remains. I'll show off the impact of this in a minute. The Throne property also had a change. It now allows you to draw the weapon as part of your attack. This is in addition to the free equip and unequip that the attack action gives you. Again, this has a fairly major impact, which I'll explain in a bit. Right, no more playing around. Mastery properties. I'm actually going to talk about them now. These were described by Jeremy Crawford as cantrip-like effects for weapons, and I think that description fits pretty well. As a martial character, you get a number of weapon masteries which you can pick and change every day by doing weapon drills. It's worth noting that you get mastery with a specific weapon type, like a short sword, not with all cleave weapons or anything like that. All weapons have a specified mastery property, although the fighter can change what property a weapon has, or even give that weapon two properties when they get to higher levels. If they do give it two properties though, they can only activate one at a time. If you want to see which weapons qualify for which properties, here's a nice easy table for you. Green means that it's the default property, and purple means that it qualifies for the fighter to change the property. Right, let's start looking at the top. Cleave is the first one, and here's my first issue with these. They have inconsistent syntax on the prerequisites. Cleave says melee weapon, comma, heavy property. But if we go to push, it says heavy, comma, two-handed, comma, or versatile property. Cleave clearly is meant to require the weapon to have both melee and heavy, but it should say that. This currently suggests that any melee weapon can have cleave, and any heavy weapon can have cleave. It's an easy fix though, so just get on that, Watsy. Cleave gives you an additional free attack against another enemy within 5 feet of an enemy you hit, but you don't add your ability modifier to the damage. This is okay, but it's conditional, and also requires you to split your damage. If you're just fighting a whole bunch of mooks, this is decent, since it will hopefully let you take out an additional kobold or whatever. 
but if you're fighting anything else, I think this is unlikely to have too much of an impact. It does work on opportunity attacks though, which could be something. I don't know how common that will actually be, because it's yet another condition, but it may come up occasionally. Flex is up next, and this gives you plus one average damage per attack. Woo! Graze is interesting. It lets you do your ability modifier as damage when you miss. Assuming you have 60% chance to hit, that means that when you have plus 3, your average damage per attack increases by 1.2. At plus 4, it increases by 1.6, and at plus 5, average damage per attack increases by 2. If you have advantage, this is more than halved. This is obviously better than flex, but I don't think it's substantially better, and I don't think this is really worth it. It will likely be quite popular though, simply because it means that you don't have those turns where you miss everything and feel bad. Right, Nick. This is a good one. It is basically just the Druid and Paladin light weapon property. You no longer need to use a bonus action to make your additional attack. That's great. Two weapon fighting builds are actually pretty good, and since you only need Nick on your so-called offhand weapon, you can still have a different property on your main weapon. Really nice one, and I'll show it off in a bit. It's actually even good for characters who mainly use heavy weapons. Push is another good one. It's a, well, it's a 10 foot push. You can't do it if the enemy is more than one size larger than you, but there are loads of uses for forced movement. You can create space to help you make ranged attacks, you can push enemies into hazards, you can escape from grapples, you can use it to disengage, you can set up for polar master reactions. There's a ton of good things. This one is a standout for me. Sap is next, and it is not one of the standouts. I think it's probably better than flex and graze, but not substantially. It only gives a disadvantage on one attack roll, and monsters generally have several attacks. Also, the no other properties condition is honestly kind of awful. This is only on Mace, Flail, and Morningstar, all of which are pretty mediocre weapons. Slow. This one is okay. It's definitely not as good as Push, but if you have a full party of longbow users focus firing an enemy, this could be considered a sort of lockdown. This is because every single player gets to apply their slow separately. It's not once per enemy, it's once per player. This also works on creatures that push wouldn't work on because they're too big or whatever. There are obviously other uses for slow as well, but I think that push is likely better in the majority of cases. I still think that slow is a, a decent pick though. Right, I'm going to skip topple and do vex first. Vex gives you advantage on your next attack against a creature if you hit it. On paper, that's quite good. However, I think that in practice, advantage is already quite easy to come by. Fairy Fire and Web are two of the best low level concentration spells, for example, and the party's caster can use one of these to give the entire party advantage. As such, I think that Vex is probably less impactful than you'd think. It's still decent though, and I expect this will be the most popular mastery, because it looks so good on paper. Finally, back up to Topple. Topple lets you make an enemy fall prone if they fail a con save. Something that I find interesting about this is that it has no size limit. I think it probably should have a size limit, probably the same one as Push. This suffers from the same thing that I just said about Vex, advantage is already fairly common. The difference here though is that you can become the party-wide advantage generator. Prone is probably one of the worst forms of advantage, but the fact that it lasts for the entire party until the enemy stands up is probably good enough to make it the strongest mastery property. If I had to rank these, I'd probably say Topple is best, closely followed by Nick and Push, then Vex and Slow, and I probably wouldn't recommend the rest. Right, with that all said and done, let's have a look at the actual weapons and work out which ones are the best. I'm not going to consider switching mastery properties here. I might talk about it when the fighter comes out, but it's probably a bit too much detail right now. Starting with the ranged weapons, my vote is for the heavy crossbow and hand crossbow or if you don't have Crossbow Expert, the short bow. The crossbows both require Crossbow Expert, but that's a fairly decent feat now. The Heavy Crossbow is the only ranged push option, and that's a really, really good support option. Push at range can help keep enemies away from you, and it can also help get your allies out of dangerous situations. This is honestly amazing. The Hand Crossbow is probably the best Vex option, because it has the light property. Short bow is just behind though, it's just lacking the light property. Next up is the melee two weapon fighting build. The Nick weapon is obviously the scimitar, it's the only d6 one. As for your main weapon, either the short sword if you need to use dex, but the hand axe otherwise, just because you can throw it if you need to. Heavy weapons now. 
Lance and Pike are the standouts. They both work with pole on master and have topple and push respectively. Lance is especially good because when you're mounted you can one hand it. This means that you can use a shield and also means that it works with fighting style and dueling. Maul is also an option if you want to use 2d6 but I don't think it's as good. There is one other weapon though that I want to talk about because I think it's probably the sleeper most improved thing here. Maybe with exception for the lance. That is the dagger. If you are playing any character who has a spare weapon mastery and isn't already using a nick weapon, I recommend picking dagger. Let me show you why. Right then, here we are on the battle map. I'm not going to specify a class for this character, but for this to work you need to have extra attack and a spare weapon mastery. This also involves a technique called weapon juggling. If you're unfamiliar, I have a video about the light weapon property that I made back at Expert Classes, which explains weapon juggling in detail. However, I'll go through this step by step, so it should be easy enough to understand. I'm also going to be showing off the updated Lance here, so this character took Pile on Master at 4th level, and has Weapon Mastery in the Lance and the Dagger. Right, we're on a horse facing down an ogre. In our right hand we have a Lance, and in our left hand we have a Shield. It's the start of our turn, and we have commanded our horse to take the Disengage action. We walk it a short distance back, and then take the Attack action. As part of our first attack, we use the Equipping and Unequipping Weapons feature, and unequip our Lance. Then as part of the Thrown Weapon property, we equip a Hand Axe, and immediately throw it. We then use the Nick property of a Dagger, which we have Mastery in, to draw it with its Thrown Weapon property, and then immediately throw it as the free Light Weapon additional attack. Then, still as part of that same attack, we use Equipping and Unequipping Weapons to re-equip our Lance. Extra attack now, and we make an attack with the Lance, potentially activating Topple, because we have Mastery in the Lance. This then activates Polar Master's bonus action, because the Lance is heavy and also has the Reach property. So we make a bonus action with the other end of the Lance, which again could trigger Topple. Finally, the Horse backs a little bit further away, and now if the Ogre tries to approach us, we get our Polar Master reaction attack, which again, could trigger Topple. Whenever you can generate space between yourself and an enemy, using a hand axe and a dagger with weapon mastery can turn one attack into two attacks. The impact of this is gigantic. Let's now assume that this character was a 5th level fighter, with the feats Fighting Style 2 Weapon Fighting, Fighting Style Dueling, Pole on Master, and Heavy Weapon Master, and they also spent their third weapon mastery on the hand axe. That turn that I just explained now has an average damage per round of 28.15. In 2014, a 5th level fighter using Crossbow Expert, Sharpshooter, and Archery did 20.32 damage per round. Now let's compare a single plus 5 modifier D10 weapon attack against a Hand Axe and Dagger combo attack with absolutely no investment other than Dagger Weapon Mastery. The D10 weapon does an average of 6.58 damage, but the Hand Axe and Dagger combo does 6.9 damage. If you can spare a single fighting style feat on two weapon fighting, you already use dueling, or you get mastery with your hand axe, then the throws become even better. There are so many ways to use this dagger tech as well. If you're fighting with a push weapon, pull out some weapons and throw them. If you kill an enemy, throw the combo at the next one before you run up. These attacks are completely free. Because you're using them as thrown weapons, they don't mess with your weapon equipping cycles at all. That's why I think they're so good. And that's everything I wanted to talk about. Thanks for watching. Use daggers. I really like quite a few of the changes here. Not too fond of the exhaustion removal, some of the feats were still mediocre and a few of the masteries were just kind of eh. But push, topple, nick and the throne property are amazing. If you enjoyed, subscribe and all that. Also please share this with your friends, it's a really good way to get the word out. If you want to support me monetarily, I now have a Patreon. It's only just been made public, so you can be one of the first to join my Discord and chat to me about this playtest, or I don't know, Zelda or something. I think that I'm going to do Sorcerer next. They're one of my two favourite classes from this UA, and I think there's a few things that many people have missed. Bye!